Please stand and turn and face the cross as it's brought in. Then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they'd heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Continue with our confession. Return to me with all your heart, says the Lord, with prayer and fasting, with weeping and mourning, with broken and contrite hearts. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Take a moment of silence to re reflect on what a blessing that is in our lives. O God, in your kindness, have pity on us. O God, in your mercy, 
wash away our sins, cleanse us from the stain and guilt of our sins, those we know and those of which we are unaware. In our thinking, our speaking, and our doing, we have exalted ourselves. We lack true humility. We deserve your wrath and punishment. For the sake of Jesus Christ, turn your eyes from our iniquity and cover our guilt, that we may know again the joy of your salvation. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Rejoice in the love and mercy of God. For Jesus' sake, he has heard your plea and has forgiven all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. You are not only proclaimed as king by the shouts of Hosanna and the waving of palms, but even more so enthroned as king on the cross amid cries of crucify. We take our place with both crowds, for our sins crucified you, yet we need you to save us. Thus we cry, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Grant us your heart of humility that we may confess our dependence on you for our salvation. We pray through Jesus, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our next song. The Old Testament reading for today, Palm Sunday, comes from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 36 through 39. The Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free. Then he will say, where are their gods? the rock in which they took refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices 
and drank the wine of their drink offering. Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord.
Please rise as we take a moment to confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for our next hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. By March 4th, 1865, the day of Abraham Lincoln's second inauguration, 
Everybody knew that the South was finished. It was only a matter of time now before the battle was over. And Lincoln spent little time on war in his address. Instead, he focused on the future and reunion, on reconciliation. He wrote, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Caring for widows and orphans, binding wounds, malice toward none, charity for all. Sounds almost scriptural, doesn't it? On April 3rd, Richmond, Virginia, the capital and citadel of the Confederacy, fell to Union troops. And on April 9th, Palm Sunday, General Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox to General Ulysses S. Grant. The war had essentially ended. Newspapers were hard pressed to keep up with the demand for the extra editions they were publishing. The Evening Star in Washington, D.C., in a special third edition of the day, printed at four o'clock in the afternoon, reported the glorious news. As we write, Washington City is in such a blaze of excitement and enthusiasm as we have never before witnessed here in any approachable degree. The thunder of cannon, the ringing of bells, the eruption of flags from every window and housetop, the shouts of enthusiastic gatherings on the streets, all echo the glorious report, Richmond is ours. On April 14th, Good Friday, Union forces reoccupied Fort Sumter and raised Old Glory over the place where the war had started four years earlier. But that night, all the shouts of triumph turned to tragedy when in the darkness of Ford's theater, Abraham Lincoln became the first U.S. president to be assassinated. How quickly triumph can turn to tragedy. On this first day of Holy Week, Palm Sunday, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, rode into Jerusalem to the cheers of crowds waving palm branches, traditional symbol of victory. If there had been a Jerusalem evening star in those days, they would have been busy putting out extra editions themselves. The Savior was big news. But then by the following Friday, the cheers had turned to tears when their Savior was crucified, murdered really on a tree of the cross because he'd done nothing to deserve death. That whole Lincoln Jesus thing has some interesting parallels, doesn't it? But then life can be like that. You know, first the feeling of triumph and then you get blindsided by tragedy. And it doesn't usually involve things like murder or mayhem. The housing market in the county and in Camarillo is crazy high right now. Homes are on and off the market in a weekend and selling for record prices. You can look at your equity and feel like a rich man or a wealthy woman and we just keep getting richer but housing bubbles have burst before. Now, not your fault, maybe, if it happens again, but it doesn't matter. You can be doing everything right and go from the, the top of the world to into the basement and nothing flat, from somebody to just anybody, from something to nothing. That, that's just life. It happens. Everybody takes a hit now and then, and nobody is immune. But Jesus, God's son, if you didn't know the story, or you were hearing it for the very first time, you'd be shocked. You know, God the Father, the Creator, would, would certainly spare His own Son from the sufferings of our fallen world, but He didn't. He couldn't. It was one of the keys to our redemption. You know, we know that Jesus was God too, God and man, the second person of the Trinity. And we know from the Bible that when He consented to step down from heaven and step into our world and into our flesh to save us from sin, and teach us about our God of love, that he set aside his divinity for a time to experience and suffer what we experience and suffer. He was tempted, although he never sinned. He knew hunger and thirst and the hurt of loss and betrayal and the joy of friendships. He performed miracles to show people the power of God, that he was who he claimed to be, the very son of God. He healed the sick, sick restored sight to the blind, made the lame walk and even raised the dead. He talked about his kingdom, a kingdom not of this world and yet a greater kingdom than this world has ever known. Some people, especially the church leaders, hated him for it. All they could hear was blasphemy. All they saw, 
all they allowed themselves to see, was Jesus the man. Because if he turned out who he claimed to be, then the cushy world they enjoyed was about to come crashing down around them. But others, many others, heard his message of unconditional love and embraced it like the lifeline it was. They loved him and believed in him and found forgiveness and a future in heaven through faith in him, despite the fact that he really didn't look very much like the king they expected. In fact, when he finally arrived, he was totally unexpected in so many ways. The miracles were a powerful testimony, and many saw and they believed because of them. The news of what he'd been doing spread like wildfire, sort of a first century version of going viral. He was something else, all right, but the king of kings? The superhero they'd expected would come to free them from living under the thumb of the, the hated Roman Empire, but all he seemed to talk about was love, sin and love, repentance and love, forgiveness and love. They loved the idea of a savior, even a new king. It was Jesus they were a little reserved about. Now, once they figured out he'd come to save them from sin, not from Rome, he became an easy target for the party line of the chief priests and the scribes. His mode of arrival into Jerusalem that last week probably didn't help his cause any. Those who already believed must have wondered how anyone could have missed seeing the truth of him, but for those who didn't. I mean, sure, the crowds lined the roads as he, as he came into the city. They waved their palm branches and threw them onto the road in front of him. They cheered and rejoiced at his arrival, shouting their hosannas. But when the government and church officials saw him coming through the crowds, what was that he was riding on? A donkey? A colt of a donkey? Conquering kings didn't come into town on a donkey. Conquering kings rode magnificent stallions. They rode war horses. They drove chariots. They led parades of soldiers, not religious pilgrims. Based on their experience with the Roman Empire, image was everything, not humility. Image, pride, that was everything. It could turn a minor victory into a major success. It could turn a major victory into a triumph that filled people with hope and security and pride. You want to hear how kings are supposed to enter a city? Plutarch, a famous Greek historian, in, in the, actually enjoyed Roman citizenship in the latter part of the first century, uh, was a historian and biographer who uh, uh, actually authored some biographies of some famous Romans and some famous Greeks. And in the account of Roman consul Aemilius Paulus, he describes a triumphant procession into Rome to celebrate his decisive victory over the Macedonians in 168 BC. Scaffolds had been erected in the circuses and the forums and wherever else uh, they could find to, that citizens might be afforded a better view. The spectators all wore white. All the temples were opened and filled with garlands and perfumes. It was something to see and something to smell. Triumph was literally in the air. It lasted three days as statues, pictures, and colossal images seized from the enemy were carried along on 250 chariots. Three days as wagon after wagon rolled through the streets, piled high with the richest fine and and finest armor and weapons of the Macedonians. Three days as 3,000 men carrying hundreds of vessels filled with gold and silver coins. Each one took four men to carry. The third day early in the morning began with the trumpeters, followed by young men elaborately dressed, leading 120 oxen destined to be sacrificed to the gods, their horns gilded with gold, their heads adorned with ribbons and garlands. The gold cups and plates used at the king's own table were paraded by next. Then came the Macedonian king's own chariot, filled with his armor, followed by the king's children and their attendants and teachers. Then came Perseus himself, the defeated king, clad all in black. All this was followed by 400 golden crowns that had, uh, sent by cities that had been conquered or had simply pledged their loyalty to the empire without a fight. That's how a celebrated general or a Roman consul, the highest elected office in Rome, would enter a city. But the king of kings he came riding on a lowly donkey. Where's the strength and power in that? You know, where's the projection of confidence and power or even hope, at least to that culture? You know, where had his PR firm been? I guess he didn't need one. You just had to watch him. You just had to hear him teach. He was truly a man of the people who related to the people, and they related to him. 
to his humanity. To know him was to believe in him, one-on-one, -on -one, just like today. So can you see how people's sense of triumph that Palm Sunday was so easily turned to tears, and in many cases taunts by temple leaders on the following Friday? You know, what kind of threat, other than maybe some serious rioting, maybe, uh, do you think Jesus really posed in their minds? What kind of, of power did he project that could stand up to the power of Rome? You know, world powers couldn't stand up to Rome. What kind of threat could one man and a group of ragtag followers be? And as for his followers, even his closest disciples expected him to demonstrate his kingdom and kingship in more earthly ways. They'd hoped he'd come to redeem Israel, and he had. But from, not from bondage to Rome from bondage to sin. A much greater victory, really, than they could ever have imagined. And so the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees had little trouble generating large crowds who were under their own influence by Good Friday, who would not be cheering Jesus with their hosannas like those Galilean uh, pilgrims who had come to celebrate the Passover. Now these new crowds, who could easily see the so-called uh, Savior would hold out no hope against Rome, had been primed to shout instead, crucify him crucify him. It would be their protest against a blasphemer who had claimed to be the son of God. Now we know that Jesus had come at just the right time in just the right place to fulfill the prophecies that had been spoken about him hundreds of years before. But what if it could have been different? What if he could have come today? Now what if he did? What if he stepped down into our so-called, you know, enlightened world? to force us to confront our sin and our need for a savior. That's really what's been happening as we read part of his passion story each Wednesday night of Lent. And as he confronted us in his word, I tell you the truth. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. Whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. One of you will betray me. For this I have loved you, that you also would love one another. So much to think back on, to remember. We don't have to be able to look him in the eye to, to feel his stare upon us as our hearts turn away in shame. We certainly hope he would be welcomed if he came back today, but you know, all we can really do is hope. We're only, believers only make up about a third of the world. As the service this morning takes a turn toward Good Friday in just a little while, when we read the passion story of our Lord from the, the Gospel of Luke, You'll have a chance to be in that crowd. You'll have a role to play. You'll be asked to shout, crucify him. And when you do, I hope you'll recognize that you had a role to play when that story was first played out almost 2,000 years ago. Jesus came not just to keep the law for the ancients, the life that God expected and demanded of them that they couldn't manage. He came to stand in for us as well. On the cross, the punishment for our failures and disobedience was meted out to him on Good Friday as well. See, people haven't changed. Never really will change, the Bible says. Not in this life anyway. And so the need for the Savior hasn't changed. In fact, it may be greater than ever. Congress sent a, a bipartisan bill to the president for a signature on March 29th that will criminalize lynching as a federal hate crime, penalized by up to 30 years in prison. And your first reaction might be to ask, do we really need a law like that? Murder has always been against the law. You know, trying to hang somebody, that's always been against the law. But evidently we did, at least on a, on a federal level. And you should know that it was the 200th attempt in 100 years to get one passed. There's an historical uh, book by author James Allen that chronicles lynching in the United States. In it, he calls himself a picker. He says, I collect what the things that people don't want and sell them to people who do. And along the way, he discovered that in America, everything is for sale, even national shame. The book is a collection of, of picture postcards of lynching victims from all backgrounds all across the whole country. Most of them are from the early 1900s. And as you can imagine, they're disturbing. The fact that people would even publish and sell hundreds of these photo cards to others as souvenirs to mail to their friends is nothing short of disturbing. But even more disturbing than the grotesque images is what he calls the lingering pack, the onlookers, sometimes a dozen, sometimes hundreds. Uh, 
men smoking cigars and smiling, uh, women and children gossiping, laughing. It's, it's almost a party atmosphere to it, a celebration. And a lot of the documentation with the photos indicates that the lynchers, who often had to break into jails to get at their victims, were rarely brought to justice. So here's the thing. Uh, we watched Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, and maybe you have plans to do that yourself this week. And we're repulsed by the graphic scenes of brutality and inhumane treatment that Jesus received. We're offended by the injustice of Jesus' trial and his crucifixion. Even over the protest of Pilate himself, who saw no cause for the death penalty. And we think to ourselves, how barbaric those people were and how supposedly holy and righteous church leaders acted selfishly in their own best interest despite the evidence. That was Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. James Allen's book, Without Sanctuary, memorialized what was happening right here in America just over 100 years ago. So what's really changed? Not us. Our need for a savior is still very real. Holy Week seems like such a picture of contrast and reversals of fortune, but it's really not. It was God's plan of salvation from the beginning of time, playing itself out on a field we'd rather not be anywhere near. And yet each one of us has already played our part, just like Jesus needed to play his in order to rescue us from God's wrath and punishment. It wasn't just the crowds who shouted crucify him on Friday who needed a savior. It was also the crowds who shouted Hosanna on Palm Sunday. If the whole movement of the story from, from Palm Sunday to Good Friday demonstrates that anything at all of continuing value beyond the history of the moment, like some would have us believe, it clearly demonstrates the unconditional love of a merciful God to repentant sinners, just like us. Because even though Jesus may not have looked like the people's expected version of a savior king on that Palm Sunday, he was exactly what they needed, exactly what we need today. Amen. Now may that very special peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll take a moment now to receive your gifts, uh, your tithes, and your offerings. for our offertory.
Please be seated. It's customary on Palm Sunday for the church to read the Passion story from uh, whatever gospel cycle we're in. Um, this year we'll read it from the Gospel of St. Luke beginning at chapter 23. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together. <clears throat> A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify, crucify. A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish him, release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots for his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Please rise for the remainder of our Passion reading. 
It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for his spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid it in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was a day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. This is the passion of our Lord. Praise Please be seated for our next song. Please rise for prayer. All glory, praise, and honor be to you, O Lord. You are our Redeemer and our King, our Savior and our Friend. We adore you and exalt your holy name. Reign over us, not according to our devising and manipulation, but according to your good and gracious will. Lord Jesus Christ, as you brought healing to untold numbers during your ministry on earth, so bring the ministry of healing into our midst according to your will. Grant healing, comfort, and faith to those who are sick or in need this day. Hear us as we pray for them. Lord of life, your death on Calvary's cross means life for us. Today we pray the comfort of assurance of the resurrection to new life be with the families of all those who mourn the loss of loved ones this week. Grant them comfort, hope, and assurance. Lord, during this holy week, strengthen our faith and trust in you. As we move from the triumph of Palm Sunday with its cries of Hosanna to the institution of the Lord's Supper on Monday, Thursday, to the agony of Good Friday, to the glories of Easter. Be with us and send your spirit that our meditation on your passion may move us
to greater love for you and for others. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his very, very special peace. Amen. May be seated for a closing hymn. Okay, just a few announcements uh, to catch up on what's going on this week. Um, uh, Super Tuesday is 7 o'clock. If you serve on a committee, you should be aware of that. Uh, Monday, Thursday, we'll have a, a worship service. No, no, uh, no more soup suppers till uh, Advent, but uh, Monday, Thursday, church service, communion service. Uh, we'll talk about the institution of communion uh, at 7 o'clock on Thursday. And then on Good Friday, we'll have two worship services, one at noon. Um, and then uh, a, a tenebrae service, Service of Darkness, 
at 7 p.m. And then our Easter schedule is a regular schedule, uh, nine for traditional uh, communion service and 11 for uh, praise uh, communion service uh, down in the fellowship hall. In between, we'll serve uh, an Easter brunch from 10 to 11, and, uh, or 10, a little before 10, a little after 11. I don't know how that works. Um, they'll figure it out. Uh, anyway, uh, and also, let's see. Um, don't forget that there's a, another blood drive scheduled for April 30th. So um, uh, if you're uh, able to uh, sign up for that, Linda will be outside with her clipboard to uh, save your spot. All right? And you're always very, uh, very good about responding to those things. Pastor Mike? Just wanted to add a little bit more detail on the Easter schedule in particular. Thanks, Pastor Rob, for that rundown. And uh, there's an Easter egg hunt for kids from preschool all the way up to sixth grade. And we're going to redeem our empty eggs that remind us of the empty tomb. So there's an uh, object lesson built into the Easter egg hunt. And thank you for those who've already donated candy. If you'd like to bring some this week when you come for Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday, you can put it in the kitchen, the office, uh, and later anywhere I'll find it. It's like an Easter egg hunt. Um, so that's what's going to happen um, on Easter morning. The um, egg hunt will probably take place well, whenever the service gets done because yeah. we don't want to leave the kids out. Uh, so it might be 10, 15, 10, 30. Thanks a lot. Oh, also, uh, thank you for everyone uh, who came yesterday. We had a mom's trading post for the first time. Um, it was like a little boutique and some of the preschool families, uh, thanks to Sunshine Hut now, she organized the whole thing, went really well. We'd like to do it again next month. And if you'd like a table to put out your own wares, uh, see me or, or Sunshine, thanks. Yeah. In your bulletin, we have the insert again for the Peace Buddies. We're encouraging everybody to please sign up. We're trying to match two to three people, and we're going to be including the shut-in. And the whole point is that we just call each other, send each other a note, or get together. We just want everybody to stay connected. So please complete it and then put it in my mailbox. Thank you. Yes, Vera. There you go. <laughs> Enough said about that, right? <laughs> God bless your day and uh, your week. Keep up to see you during the week for uh, uh, some of our Holy Week services. God bless.